Life in the townships of South Africa is a struggle. The shadow of apartheid lingers. Unemployment is rampant, the highest in the country, as is the infant mortality rate. People are cripplingly poor. About 50,000 orphaned and vulnerable children live in this area. Every household we work with is deeply affected by HIV and AIDS. The Ubuntu Center stands in the middle of Zwede Township. It is a soaring expression of our hopes and beliefs. A child can walk into the Ubuntu Center, talk with a counselor, get the medical help she needs, and receive intensive academic support. Those are powerful pictures. The story behind it is even more powerful. The gentleman you're about to see on camera is going to talk to us about us. He is uh, Jacob Leaf, founder and CEO of Ubuntu Education Fund and the author of the book, I Am Because You Are. Um, Ubuntu, where is this and why is it so important? So Ubuntu is a philosophy, the idea that we are connected through our humanity, our politics, race, shouldn't matter, it's that we're human beings, we should treat each other. It's not a, it's not a place, respect. it means something. It's a philosophy, it's a way of life, and that's why I named the organization that I founded uh, 17 years ago, Ubuntu Education Fund. I thought it was such a powerful philosophy. So we work down in South Africa in an area that's riddled with just extreme poverty, and I, wanted, well, I started this organization when I was 21 years old. I wanted to prove that if you took a child who'd been raped or who'd lost their parents and invested in them the same way someone invested in me, that they can make it out. And so over the last 17 years, we've built this organization where we actually start with pregnant mothers, ensure a healthy birth, and work with these kids every day of their lives until we get them into university or employment. We call it cradle to career. Now, you grew up in New Jersey. Yeah, so I, I was born in New York City, uh, not far from here actually, moved out to South Orange, New Jersey, where I lived uh, until I was about 13 years old, and then my family moved to London. You wind up being exposed to this, these horrific conditions that the children are suffering from, and what triggers in you? So it's, it actually began when I was in London as a 13-year-old. I was getting into a lot of trouble. I was in a big city, and I came across this free Nelson Mandela march, mm -hmm. and it inspired me, and I started volunteering, and four years later, I went through... He was in jail at the time? Yeah, and four years later, I went with a group of students in 1994 to observe the country's first democratic elections, and... L let's put things in perspective for folks who don't put this... Understand this. Was the clerk in power at the time? Yes, he was. So the clerk is in power at the time. Apartheid is... Just about ending. Okay. And, and we're seeing the first democratic elections where Nelson Mandela will move into power. Mandela's in jail for 27 years. That's correct. I believe 27 years. The movement to free Mandela had been going on for the entire time. Yes. It happens. The first free elections happen, and you're right there. As a 17-year-old. I mean, to experience that, I'd never been to Africa, and I was with the group. We were 15 different nationalities represented, and we were touring the country, meeting with your sort of neo-Nazis, all the way through to your Robo Island freedom fighters, people who spent their life <laughs> in jail with Mandela. And I meet this old woman, and she can barely stand, and she tells me she waited 30 hours to cast her ballot. As a 17-year-old, you think you know everything, you're confident. Yeah, I look right. at her, and I'm like, you waited seven, or you waited 30 hours? And she taps me on my shoulder and says, no boy, you don't understand, I've waited 85 years. And she walks away. And at that moment I said, I don't understand. I don't know what freedom means. I don't know what democracy means. I grew up in this, but I took it for granted. And I said I want to become part of what they were calling the New South Africa. And that's really uh, where it all began. So I came to the States for university and had a professor sponsor me to go back and through some funny situations, I ended up in this one area called Port Elizabeth. And I moved in with this family and lived uh, there for six months, and I just was exposed to such extreme poverty. Of course, I overly romanticized it. I knew in the back of my mind I could always leave. Sure. But what I witnessed were children who believed in the power of education as a ticket out of poverty, and that was inspiring. I remember one morning there, the guy I was living with, he woke me at four in the morning, he said, let's go for a walk. And he brings me to an area that's all shacks. In front of each shack is a child holding a brick over an open fire, and they're using it to iron their school uniform so they look proud to go to, look good right. to go to school. And I literally, I saw this, the fire was burning in these kids and I thought we could do something. At the same time I saw, I knew nothing about the nonprofit world, but I saw all this money pouring in these big aid agencies, these big foundations. Where was the money going? Well, every, it's interesting. Everyone was talking, right. defining success by how many um, library books they'd hand out, how many cups of soup. And I'd watch and I was looking at these little girls who'd been raped or these kids living with no parents and I'm thinking, a cup of soup and a wind-up computer is nice, but that's not gonna get you out of poverty. How do you, how'd you find success? 
So we work with these, success for us is stable health, stable employment, meaning we work with these kids every day of their lives. That's real sustainability. You know, people always ask me, what's your exit strategy? There's no exit strategy with raising kids. Right. I mean, you're with them every day of their lives. And by the way, it doesn't always work. Kids are difficult. But what does work is being there with them. If they need glasses, you don't say to them, oh, we're not a vision organization. You buy them glasses. If they're hungry, you feed them. And it's not a great innovation, but it's about, it's an old recipe. It's how you raise kids. And you stick with them the whole way. And that sustained intervention is what works. And you have to, you're constantly raising money, aren't you? Yeah, all the time. All the time. I saw your eyes when you went. <laughs> but, we're, you know, remember, we're public television. Uh, no, no money, no mission, right? You know, it's, uh, we're looking for people to invest in the long term who understand that it's not a quick fix solution. I can't raise a child in a 12-month grant cycle. It takes a long time. Yeah, right, 12-month grant. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, show us, Show us your metrics. <laughs> Listen, I mean, we do, we play that game, and it's real, and we, yeah, we can show measure our success. But at the same time, you have to be careful with over quantifying everything. Remember, we're dealing with human lives beings here. I was going to say that. Absolutely. Children. And, you know, raising children isn't scalable. Mm. It's deeply individualized. What worked for you didn't work for me. And there's not a one sort of... One size fits all. Not at so all. Let me ask you this. What is it, what's the message you want to leave for those watching on public television, Fios, and folks listening on the radio side? What is it that you want to say to sure. everyone right now about these children? Well, I think it's if you invest in a cause, a nonprofit, a charity, whatever you want to call it, whether it's South Africa or the South Bronx or South Orange where I grew up in, yeah. it doesn't matter. Invest in a disadvantaged community in the same way you'd invest in your own family and afford them the same dignity. Don't ask the question, how do you reach more kids for less money? No, it's not, that's not how you raise your own children. And until we start asking those right, the right questions and it's still, until we sort of change the way we invest in uh, poor communities, uh, I don't think we're going to have an impact. And that's the message of your book. We appreciate everything you're doing, Jacob. And Thank the you, name sir. of the book is I Am Because You Are. And um, I wish there were more people like you. By the way, the foreword of the book um, by the great Archbishop Desmond Tutu. An inspiring the, person who's uh, helped our organization a lot as the patron of our organization. Been leading for a long time. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by PNC Bank, Bergen Community College, United Water, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by Fedway Associates. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.